Welcome to Maine. Maine taxi driver stories, anyone? Be me, young taxi guy, driving along native tribe named Lake. See kid walking by the side of the road. 11.30 p.m. Kids dressed in sweat-stained t-shirt and sports shorts. No shoes. Pull off, unlock door, and ask him to get in. Nice guy taxi driver JPEG. Kid gets in, thanks me for the ride. Turn up air conditioner to keep him cool. Tells me he's going up to the head of the lake where his parents live. Drop him off. Tell him to get some shoes. He laughs and goes inside. Pick up newspaper a couple days later. Kid is dead. Drunk driving. Drove into lake. Find out from cop buddy that kid's body was in the car. Happened two hours before I picked him up. Still get the heebie-jeebies every time I drive by that lake. I have a shit ton more because Maine is haunted as fuck. Meh, fuck it. I don't get a chance to tell these stories often enough. Halloween is when people want to hear about it. Main taxi guy again, by the way. Get a call to pick up at the south end of the county. Tiny woodland town. Maybe 500 residents. No gas station. That's how tiny it is. 8 p.m. at night. Late dusk, in other words. Still light, but limited. Headlights are on. Logging the run while waiting for customer at his trailer, which sits right next to a cliffside slash earth bank thing leading to a stream below. Toot horn because I waited five minutes and nothing. See tall shadowy figure rising up from the bank. Figure, it's the guy. It is. He gets in back and asks to go to McDonald's, which is like 30 minutes away. Tell him the fare. He's cool with it. Roll up to Mickey D's and roll down rear window so he can order himself. Dude orders 85 cheeseburgers, 100 large fries, and 15 chicken wraps. Why wasn't I invited, bro? That JPEG. Girl on the mic is all, what the fuck is this friend on? 30 minutes to get the food ready. Take him home. Ask him why all the food. For my friends who live in the woods. Friends. These guys hate electricity. Hermits, huh? McDonald's big into hermit community? Hey man, don't knock it, okay? They saved me from the demons that live in my house. Cool guys, they just want fries and burgers in return? They're nice like that. Fare is like 45 bucks. He hands me $200 and asks me to help him bring the stuff in to the edge of the bank. Get out, move stuff over. It's too dark to see anything but the water. Hear a bunch of bags being opened. Happy grunts. Shake head and get back in car. Nope the fuck out of there. I've got a few more stories about the Baron of Burgers. Get a call from Central about picking up Burger Baron again. Noontime. Sure, I can spot his friends if they want my beef jerky. Sasquatches? Roll up to find BB has axed a telephone pole next to his trailer down. No power to the house now. How did he call? Cell phone, probably. Whatever. Dude is loaded. Toot the horn. Guy comes over the ridge. Bro has gone full grizzly Adams. It's been like two weeks since burger stock down by the stream. Fur coat. Raccoon hat. He smells like beef stew. Hey, it's you again, he says as he gets in back again. Yeah, how are your friends? Awesome. We all live in woods now. Yeah? Get the fur coat at Goodwill? Nah, man. My friends made it for me. The hat too? Nah. My cousin bought it for me from Cabela's. Oh, uh, my bad. It's cool. It's a cool hat. Where are we headed, chief? Up to the mall. It's like 130 fare up there, man. You sure? It's all good. Here we go, that JPEG. Take him to the mall upstate. He falls asleep in the back. Sleeps like a baby back there. I almost forgot he was here if he didn't smell like soup. We get there. He flashes a 50 and says he'll tag that on top of everything, including the tip, if I come in and push the cart. Whatever, I'm up for it. We go into the home supply store and he buys blankets, jackets, tents, etc. Building an encampment. Sure am, Uncle Josh. Who the fuck are you talking to? I'm David. No, you are Uncle Josh. Hey man, you're paying waiting time, so you can call me Mama if you want. You're such a card, Uncle Josh. Okay then. Time to check out. Start down the pots and pans aisle. Guy leaps in front of me, shoves me and the cart back. Uncle Josh, are you crazy? They'll eat you. Pardon me to all fuck, Chief. I didn't see him. Holy shit. He's legit insane. He grabs one of the blankets and drapes it over me as he holds me like an injured soldier and takes me to the cash out. Girl out the counter giggles. They'll eat me, I tell her winking. She nods slowly as she's scanning the tags. 
He ponies up 500 in cash and tells her to keep the change. Load up the car. Where to now, Daddy Morbucks? He laughs and says to take him home. Falls asleep again. Get him home. He puts 300 in my hand and kisses my cheek. Ew. See you soon, Uncle Josh. He waves to me as he starts throwing blankets and tents down the embankment. Shut the trunk and cruise away. I got crazy on me, blech. Bergen Baron doesn't ride anymore. The last time I talked to him, he called Central and asked for Uncle Josh. The office knows that's my nickname, I guess. I get on the phone. Hey, Chief, it's been a few months. How are you and your friends? We're good. Listen, Josh, this is important. I put him on speakerphone. The whole office shuts up and leans in. Okay, Chief, what is it? Josh, the dog catches the clover. And he hung up. Boom. Done. Haven't heard from him in three years. Get orders from Central that I'm supposed to spend the weekend at a ski lodge downstate with one of the company's valued customers. Oh, yes. This means that I get to drive the Escalade. Headed leather seats, navigation, satellite radio. Also means I get to hang out with ski bunnies all weekend between trucking high mucky mucks between the lodge and the town at the bottom of the mountain. This gonna be good. Happy family. Two teens, braces, cute as fuck. Mom and dad are too busy with their blackberries. Kids get bored of listening to their music. Tell them about the burger chief. Everybody laughs. Good times. Get to the lodge. Bring in their stuff. They've reserved a room for me. Lucky ass motherfucker. Crash in a studio apartment space. Dig the view. Can't smoke inside. Have to smoke by the SUV. Late at night. Get up to piss. Decide to smoke too. Leaning on the truck all bundled up. Hear some coyotes in the distance. Fucking hate Maine. Puff, puff, puff. About ready to stamp out the cigarette when I hear a coyote cry out in agony. Like, just beyond the headlights of the SUV. Hear bones snapping. Holy shit, what the fuck? Remember Burger Chief's friends. Shut headlights off and climb into the SUV. Lock doors. Something heavy bumps into the ass end of the SUV. Rocks it a little. Holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. Pull hat down over eyes. Couldn't eat me under a blanket. Hopefully hats qualify. Hear heavy breathing on the window next to me. It goes away. Wait for 20 minutes, then click on the headlights. Snowing its ass off. Get out and book it to the lodge. Find bloody footprints under the fresh snow. Looks like a regular dude. Size 10 shoe, maybe. Goddamn, friend, you crazy. Cover the bloody stuff up with snow before the family wakes up. Just me posting, huh? Fine then. Still at the lodge. Eating breakfast the next morning. Family comes by in waves. Dad explains they want to go to town to buy a new snowboard for Junior. And the girls want to go shopping for cute new snow gear. Totally cool with that. Get me the fuck off this mountain of death. Notice a bloody streak on the back gate. Wipe it off with a handful of snow. Teen girl asks what I'm doing. Just wiping off some crud from the road. Are you going to wash this while we're in town? Yeah. Sounds like a great idea. Drop family off. Go to wash truck. Sparkly clean. Brain can still see blood smear on the back gate, though. Pick them up and return to the mountain. Why? Back in where I was before, parallel to this end of the lodge. Mountain Ranger approaches me as I get out of the SUV. Already dropped the family off. Were you here last night? Yep. Came out to have a smoke. Some weird stuff happened. Animal weird? I shake my head and explain what happened. She nods and blows me off until I dig up the snow and show her the blood. There's a bear down here. What the fuck, since when do bears have man feet? Did you tell anyone? Who would believe me? I'm going to talk to the other rangers, and we'll shut the side of the mountain down if we think there's trouble. So, keep my mouth shut. That would be the best thing until we do something. The mountain is loaded with daredevils. Somebody will go looking for the bear. Right, thanks. She goes back to patrolling, staying clear of the tree line where the noises came from. Last chapter of Weekend of Horror on Murder Mountain. Fuck, I hate that place. Smoke during the day. If I go out at night, I stay close to the building and hang out at the hot springs. Swanky artificial ones. There's a bar, but I can't drink. Cool guy, taxi guy. Drinking a Pepsi, smoking a few while I listen to that Saturday night band. Family is upstairs in the Grand Hall, having some fancy ass family reunion. Chilling with a bartender and a couple of ski bunnies that I've been having breakfast with for a few days. Coyotes again. Heart rate picks up. Are they annoying or what? I asked the bartender. They're a bad omen. Coyotes don't come this far up the mountain unless there's a fresh kill. Or something has chased them up. 
Jesus Christ, man, are you a fucking movie character? Well, where's the lightning and dramatic organ? He laughs and shakes his head. Nothing can get you here, it's too noisy. Right. Relax a little. Stay a little later than I should have. Ski bunnies are drunk. We laugh it up some, and I call it a night before I do something stupid. Totally forgot about staying close to the building. Hear heavy breathing, coming from under the SUV. Freeze. Standing maybe 12 feet away from the SUV. Can't see what's under it. I don't want any trouble, I say with a stern voice. 2 a.m. You just stay under there, and I'll go inside. I say, backing away from the SUV, toward the entrance to my room. The breathing slows down as something crawls around under there, like it's making a nest, or some freaky-ass shit. I open my door, and it stops crawling. I see hot breath rising from under the running boards, as if it's coming out from under the truck. I don't want to know what you are. Fall through the door and kick it shut behind me. Spin around and put my back against the door. Nothing. No noise. Shut the yard light off that had illuminated the SUV and that thing's breath. Get up in the morning and call the ranger down. Stay in the room until she comes to the door. Knocking makes me shit myself. Peek through the door. What's up, David? Remember that bear? Yes. I point through the door toward the SUV, where some serious marks were left. What happened? I come out, then you pull your gun out and point it at the truck. I am not taking any risks. We approach the SUV. She has her gun ready. There are a ton of marks all over the place, like it scoops snow under the SUV and pushed it out. She kicks snow under the SUV and nothing happens. I pull out the keys and hit the panic button. Horns, sirens, lights, but nothing under it. Must have left in the night, she says, kneeling down. Holy fuck, you're nuts. I step back as she peeks under the truck and immediately backs away, standing up in a hurry. Jaws guy face JPEG. What? What did it do? Did it hurt the SUV? No, it, it pissed and shit all over the place under there. Are you fucking kidding me? I move the SUV and sure enough, it pissed and shit all over the place. Rolled around in it even. No fresh snow. Those are people tracks. That's the same foot. Seems like you got a friend, David. You know what? Fuck you, I say, rubbing my forehead. Excuse me? She asks. Sorry, this is just crazy. Are you guys going to shut down the mountain? Yes, this is too close to the lodge to be brushed off. Whatever did this needs to be chased off or captured. Oh, sweet Jesus, thank you. Family and I book it. Get a call from the ranger a few days later. She says they never found the guy that did it, but the urine and shit samples came back positive for human. She asked me again what I saw that night when I pulled my hat over my face. I told her jack shit. Never returned to Murder Mountain. Family hasn't either. But I did travel with them a few more times. Haunted docks, anyone? As I've said, Maine is a haunted ass fucking place. Stephen King isn't lying. Shit is for real up here. The following spring after Murder Mountain, Central tells me that the family is back and they want to go to the down east, Eastport. Holy fuck far away. Hey, new Escalade, and I like the family anyway. By the way, piss and shit smell wouldn't leave the air system of the SUV, so we ditched it and upgraded to a new one. Roll up to the airport. Everyone's happy to see me. Dad shakes my hand and asks me how the Burger Baron is doing. Tell him I haven't heard from him in a while. We laugh again about him. So it's a long ass air ride from the airport to Eastport. Naturally, they pick an old-ass B&B to stay in. I, however, opt out of chilling with them and book a room right on the water. They're about 15 minutes away from me. Dad asks if I want to stay, and I tell them that they should enjoy the weekend together and that I smoke. He understands, and we exchange cell phone numbers. So, the first night, I'm sitting on the back deck of this place, outside of the restaurant downstairs, smoking with a guy from New York who hates Maine, but his wife loves it. I'm fucking fed up with this wilderness shit. He tells me waving his jack and ginger around. I know what it is because I ordered a peach smoothie and the bar handles everything but coffee and soda. Preaching to the choir. If I could afford it, I'd be in Japan. Why Japan? Really? You don't know why? No, it's full of sex for- Oh. I tip my smoothie to him. We tap glasses and laugh. I hear a splashing below us. Mind you, the deck hangs out over the water by a good 8 to 10 feet. 
I put my drink down and step up to the railing, leaning over. It's just a gentle tide smacking against the rocks. Just sounded like splashing. Paranoid after Murder Mountain. I sit back down and light up another cigarette. New Yorker asks me what's up. Thought I heard a struggle down there. Standing on the balcony outside of my room, looking out over the moonlit bay. Damn, only if it didn't suck so hard here. Smoking again, tapping a can of Pepsi against the railing. Hear the splashing again. Look down. I can see the rocks again. Lots of bubbles down there now. Tides aren't shifting. Hey, anybody down there? I shout down. No reply. Just more bubbles from the rocky area. I shrug it off. Scary ocean shit. I tap the ashes off of my cigarette and lay my head against the railing. It's quiet, apart from the splashing. It stops suddenly. I look down again, and my Pepsi can gets sucked out of my hand. I'm on the third floor, mind you. Swoop. Down into the bubbles. Fuck! I throw my cigarette after it and turn away from the railing. The splashing starts again, and my Pepsi can is smacking against the rocks. The smacking gets rhythmic. Tap, tap, tap. Pause, pause, pause. Tap, tap, tap. Pause, pause, pause. I go down to put an end to the noise. There's a rocky beach down there under the deck, and I climb down to get the Pepsi can. Why the fuck am I doing this? Oh yeah, too paranoid to listen to ghosts tap the can all night. I lean out over the rocks and grab the can. I pull it up out of the water and dump the seawater out of it. I climb back up from the beach and toss the can in the trash nearest where I climbed up from. As soon as the can hits the bottom of the barrel, I hear a boat wrap up against the dock. Shit, fuck, it's gonna eat me. I spin around with my fists up, like I'm gonna punch the Kraken or something. Oh, it's just a boat. This is God telling me to stop smoking. I set my hand down on one of the pylons that poke up from the dock's ports, and I discover my cigarette is under my hand. Huh, lucky me. The ash broke off, so I lit it up again, and I look at the boat rubbing up on the dock. It's a cabin cruiser. The name on the ass end is Sea Toy. Sea Toy rubs up against the dock again and again as I'm smoking. I step off the pylon dock and onto the floating dock. I grab Sea Toy's rope and wrap around one of the weird bow tie thingies. It stops rubbing, finally. I turn around and there's another cigarette on the pylon above. I still have mine. Ha, okay, time for bed. I rush up the gangway to the pylon dock and throw my cigarette over the edge. Get to the room, lock the door. Nope, nope, nope. Too much lactose. You're having visions. I pull the shades over the glass door that leads to the balcony. Early in the morning, I wake up to find that the curtains are knocked off the railings, and the glass door is wide open. Oh, God, it knows where I sleep. I fix everything as best as I can, and lock the balcony door this time. The family and I explore Eastport for a while, before they rent a sailboat and go off pretending to be pirates. At the hotel, the New Yorker says he heard me last night. I tell him what happened, and he laughs at me, and offers to buy me breakfast. We have breakfast, his wife nags him to go sailing, I guess they sailed up here. My face when he owns Sea Toy. I spend the morning sipping Pepsi, and texting a friend back home about what's going on. The splashing starts again. I ignore it, and go inside to again, find my room is messed up. The housekeeper says it's not them. When dad, mom, and kids get back, I ask if there's a room at the B&B. I stay with them for the rest of the weekend but it gets better. Holy fuck does it go off the rails next. At the Eastport Inn, the owners have hired a medium to entertain the guests tonight. Springtime spooky shit, what the fuck? So I hang out with dad in the back of the den while the family and a couple of newlyweds get right in on the action. The gypsy looking woman comes into the room and the owners shut the lights off and light candles. Here we go. Dad and I have to shut off our phones. It makes the ghosts mad. Sure, sure. We both watch as this lady starts walking around a room, waving her hand over people's heads. She says some superficial stuff about the kids and the newlyweds. Tells mom that dad thinks she's pretty. Duh. She gets to me. I give her a glare. She smirks and grabs my cheeks. And you, you've been marked. The fuck you say? Marked? I'm freaked out now. You're marked. Something to do with your smoking. Oh, hell nah. I pull my hands from her face, and Dad waves her off. What was that all about? He asks. I explain the cigarette and sea toy, my room, and the splashing. He shakes his head. He doesn't know about Murder Mountain, by the way. 
I rub my forehead as she goes on about a maiden that died at the docks. Vengeful husband drowned her after she fell in love with a highwayman. Dad nudges me. I wave a hand, too interested to not listen to her. She goes on and says that the husband killed her when he smelled the cigar of the highwayman on her. Dad begins to chuckle. I nudge him and he starts laughing out loud. I get up and leave. The weekend goes off without a hitch. We leave Eastport and Dad teases me about my ghost girlfriend the whole way back to the airport. Last summer, get a call from Central to go pick up at one of the shitty hotels across town. I wheel in and pick up a scraggly looking guy. Long hair, balding on top, smells like piss and weed. He asks me to turn off the car radio and my taxi radio. I can't cut communications with Central. Just don't talk on it while I'm in here. Fair enough. We go to Goodwill. He pays in quarters and gets out. Joy. Laundry money. A few hours go by and I get called to go get him. He comes out with a cartload of 80s tech. Radios, alarm clocks, record players, phones, and a couple of TVs. Oh, fuck me. I help him load all of it and we go back to the hotel, but stop at a mom and pop food shop so we can pick up a couple of bags of frozen dinners. Nice. So I help him unload the stuff into the hotel room. Room smells like piss and weed. He pays in quarters again. Hello, Coinstar. The next day, I get a call to go get him again. I wheel in and find him standing outside of his room, facing the door, dressed as Captain Jack Sparrow. One of those buycostumes.com ones. Fake hair, sticky beard, shirt, hat, the works. He slides on a pair of Ben and Black shades and gets in the back. Ahoy, Captain. Where we be heading? Funny. Goodwill again and shut the radio off. Good enough. He asks me to wait while he goes in. He comes back with two gigantic speakers and we load them up. I help him unload them. He's nailed the radios to the walls. The clocks are hung like Christmas lights. The records are playing in reverse and the TV screens are linked with bare copper wires in the shape of a square. He pays in quarters again. Hey, it's probably not okay to nail stuff to the... He shuts the door in my face and I hear him lock it up. Okay, well, see you for breakfast then. I ask jokingly as I go back to my car. A few days go by and I get a call from Central that the police department needs me to come pick someone up at the hotel that this guy was at. Captain Quarterbag must have gotten busted for defaming property. I roll up and get out. My cop buddy is the one who called. He tells me that Captain Quarterbag got his hands on a shotgun and shot his caseworker when she finally tracked him down. Vietnam War veteran. She's in ICU and he's nowhere to be found. He opens the door and this guy had gone epileptic Spider-Man all over the inside of the hotel room with copper wire. I look to my friend who then asks me what I know about this stuff. I confess to knowing that he nailed shit to the walls, but not this level of crazy. I tell him about the stuff he bought and how he dressed. A few weeks go by and my cop friend calls to tell me that now that the investigation is over, I should probably know that they found him cocooned in the copper wire. His body was all charred up and jerkied, having been cooked by the wiring. Why did I need to know this? He tells me not to take this personally and in the future to tell them when weird stuff like this happens. So I should just put you on speed dial. Morning, noon, and night, he said. We don't talk about that, like at all. I never saw any of the guy's body, but it just sounds disgusting anyway. So this is from over the winter, December. I have a regular transport with a mentally challenged client. Cool guy, not big on the talking, unless it's a pretty girl. Driving on a sloppy road, plow guys are slacking. Splish splash might be taking a bath soon. So I slow down as we come down the steep hill and tires give. Ass end of car starts to come around like the trunk is going to lead the way now. Oh fuck nah. I cut back into the drift and tap the accelerator so the rear end straightens up. Fishtail for maybe a hundred feet until we get to the bottom of the hill. Phew. My client, let's call him Shy Eyes, giggles a little and I laugh too. We're friends. I'm stopped, giggling like a little kid when a blue light appears in my rear view. Cops? Is not having an accident illegal now? Nope. Something comes over the hill and up into the air, Duke Boy style. Slush and shit rains down on my car, and being an idiot, I cover my head like I'm going to get rained on in the car. Derp. Holy shit, this must be old as fuck. No one fucking says derp. Blue light comes over the top of the taxi. 8am in December. 
Old Mr. Sun is just getting up. Orange skies frame this icy blue triangle that glides just above my car and slows down, like it's saying sorry. Shy Eyes leans up to the glass of the windshield and looks up at it. I keep away from the glass. It doesn't fly away. It just fades out. It kind of reminded me of condensation evaporating off of cold glass. Shy Eyes doesn't remember like I do. He just remembers me being a dumbass and nearly getting us killed pretending to be Paul Walker. Theory. It's a spy plane that went kablooey when it hit the upper atmosphere. They tell us Loring Air Force Base is decommissioned and it's just used to repaint and service Humvees. That's bullshit. You know it. I know it. Spy plane takes off, supersonic, hits atmosphere, snaps in half, boom. What I'm told. Best part of taxing is government loves to truck people through. Black Shades guy and his blondie assistant get picked up in Portland. Transport them to the Air Force Base in Bangor. Neither one of them talks. I ask about it. They shake their heads. I shrug. Roll up. Guy at the gate asks for papers. CIA types don't do papers. Gate guy gets miffed, asks for ID. CIA hands him a letter. He radios the instructions into the base. Humvee rolls up to the gate. The gate opens and the gate guy leads me in, walking just ahead of my bumper. Humvee opens from the inside. Dark Shades and Blondie get out and get into the Humvee. Get turned around by gate guy. I pull up to the gate and pull down my sunglasses, staring at the guy. You know what? That guy's an asshole. I expect us to go to war with Russia any day now. He waves me on. Oh, thank God I'm diseased. I live on a lake. Shitty lake camp, but it's a swanky bachelor pad, and I'm cool with it. This was back at the end of last summer. Sitting on the front deck, looking across the street to the lake water, rocking back and forth on the porch swing. The loons are calling. Frogs are trying to get laid. It's an L.L. Bean commercial. I put my hands behind my head and drift off to sleep. I wake up to the sound of something clattering around in my trash cans. Oh, come on. I sit up and look toward the bottom of my driveway. There's this kid poking through my garbage. He's got regular kid clothes. Hey, you! Cut the shit! His head snaps up and drops the can's lid. Can't see his eyes. I just know he's looking. I stand up and point at him. Go home! Leave the trash alone! He stands there, staring. I get the same sinking feeling I did when I heard the coyote bones being snapped. What the fuck now? The kid's arms twitch a bit, like he's got a chill or something running up his spine. Well? He leans down to the trash again. Hey! I step down off of the deck and onto the gravel. My foot makes a crunching noise and something dashes into the bushes at the top of my driveway. Kid runs off down the street. I hear his footsteps for a while. I sit down on the steps for a minute, contemplating getting a gun. There's a sploosh in the lake across from my place. Like a frog just jumped into the water or something. The loon stopped calling for a minute. Well, time to go inside and lock all the doors and windows. I finally get to bed after locking the house up and listen to the loons start calling again. This is a short one, but you can probably experience it too up here. Late October, a few days before Halloween, driving on a rainy night. How did I get talked into this? Leaves falling out of the trees, getting stuck to the windshield. It's a fun time. Roll the window down to smoke. Cigarette dangling out of the window while I cruise to the next quote-unquote city along the coast to pick up a homeless guy and bring him to the hospital up my way that'll take him. Groovy tunes on the radio. I come around a tight bend and I hug the line a little closer than I should have. White Toyota is in my lane. Holy fucking shit, gonna die. Jerk the wheel to narrowly miss the car. Come to a stop to get my wits. Crazy fucking kids. This is what MTV gave us. Frazzled. Lost cigarette. Light another one and park for a minute. Puffing to some white lion. Tapping the side of the car, listening to the music. Some guy grabs my arm and leans in. You okay, mate? I smack his arm away and lean away from the window. Fuck you! I shout like that's going to scare off the woods demon that just tried to tear off my arm. Friendly, middle-aged guy. Greased hair. Shit-stained mustache. Hey man, just checking on you. Glance in my rear view and spot the Toyota sitting behind me. Well man, you scared the shit out of me. Sorry, I said hello but I guess the music was too loud. You're okay, right? Yeah, yeah, sorry for yelling. It's cool. There are a couple of deer in the road up ahead. Watch yourself. I nod and he gets in his car and pulls away. I take a minute and cool off, put it in gear and roll on. Round the bend he was talking about and come to a screeching stop turn sideways in the road. That's not a fucking deer. 
It's not even a couple of fucking deer. Middle of the road stands a moose over the top of a dead moose's body. Moose is ripped to shreds. Got hit by a moose blunder or something. Other moose is standing guard. I inch up onto guardian moose and it lowers its head, ready to charge. I stop and beep the horn. It lifts its head and steps aside. I cruise by slowly. Moose turns its head as if it's scoping me out for the guy who did this to its wife or buddy or whatever. I pull beyond the moose and stop, looking back through my mirror and the other moose lays down next to the dead one. Okay, time to leave. I get the guy and come back that same way because there's no other road that is as direct. Past the moose carcass, but no guardian moose. Round the bend again and discover it's been hit by a dump truck. Took its head clean off. Slow down as we passed ahead and those damn eyes were looking at me, or felt like it anyway. Fuck this shit, drive off. Passenger was asleep anyway. Sitting in town one night, full moon, window down listening to music. Guy and gal walk by, wave and say hello. I wave back, nice couple. I turn down the car radio and get out to walk around the car. I park down in the boatyard near one of the waterfront bars. I sit down on the hood and light up a cigarette. Girl walks up and asks for one. I offer her the lighter and a cigarette. She joins me on the hood after lighting up. Is this your job? No, I do this for the orphans. Very funny. Yeah, I've been doing this longer than I can remember. Are you happy? Lady, I'm sitting on the hood of a Crown Victoria on a Saturday night. I'm not up for life lessons and philosophy. Fine, just wanted to know. Feel bad for being a jerk. It's not a great job, but I meet people. I like people. It's a good quality to have. How about you? Smoking with taxi drivers your job? Ha, <laughs> no. I'm just a girl wandering through the world. A traveler, huh? Welcome to the road. Thanks. She gets up and walks off into the darkness of the boatyard. Okay, bye. She waves over her shoulder. I hear a hard thud come from the boatyard. Time to man up, David. Get in the car and cruise into the boatyard. High beams on. She's standing on the edge of the boat lift with a piece of a broken rowing oar. I get out and walk up to her. Everything okay? She nods and tosses the oar into the river. Gypsies are always okay, traveler. She looks over her shoulder toward me. Her eyes are that weird reflective kind that animals are, so you know that they're about to run out in front of you. Nope, nope, nope. I get back in the car and back out of the boatyard, radio to Central to send the cops down. They find a broken oar and her jacket, but nothing else. Cop friend tells me that they chased some gypsies off the public beach the morning after. Gypsies come through town a lot, they fuck up around in Canada too much. I should sign these. Sincerely, the unluckiest bastard in Maine. A couple weeks after Burger Baron's last phone call. Off duty, downstate for a jazz festival. Come across a guy pissing on a building. Classy. Walk by him and under a catwalk that connects two banks together, or some richy rich shit. I step under the catwalk as I spot a dog walking up the street. 1am. Saturday. I'm on that side of town, I guess. I pull my hands out of my pockets and clap for the dog to come to me. The dog stands there, under the street lamp's light, looking at something on the other side of the street. Its ears twitch occasionally like he's hearing something. I approach cautiously. Maybe he's tracked a raccoon. The dog's head lowers as I get closer, but it's not looking at me. I step up to the dog. It jumps a little once it realizes I'm so close. Dog snaps back to what it was looking at. There's this bat thing resting on a brick wall, like full on attached to it. I place my hand on the dog's head, gently massaging his head. Easy. It's just another animal. Dog bolts off suddenly. I watch it run off into the darkness and turn back to the bat thing. Its wings spread, and holy shit, it's huge. I'm looking at a bald eagle-sized bat thing. It crawls a little higher on the wall, ignoring me, I guess, as it heads toward an open window. Uh, what? I'm stunned. It's huge, and it's headed for that window. I pick up a rock from the road and toss it into the trash cans. It makes a big rock hitting metal noise. The bat thing falls off the wall and into the trash, tearing it to shit. I hear it snorting and tearing at things as it goes after the rock. Welp, leaving now. I take off the same way the dog did. Homeless guy tells me it's lived here for a few months, since warm weather came. The homeless avoid it. I ask him why. The fuck do you mean you ask him why? He says some crazy guy shit about how it steals souls or something. I ask him how that works. He asks for money. Nice. I hand him a 20 and he stuffs it into his underwear. Ugh. 
He tells me it comes to them in their dreams and that a couple of his friends have died after saying they'd seen it in their dreams. I sit down next to him and think for a minute. He tells me the homeless call it dream catcher. Really, that's the best you've got. I ask him why the name? You got a better name? Nope, dream catcher it is then. I get up and offer to buy him coffee, but he's content with a 20 and draws his legs under himself. I leave him and the city I was visiting. I haven't heard of Dreamcatcher again. Same main friend. On duty. Christmas time, 2010. Santa's village downtown. Kids everywhere. Gypsies are in town, selling stolen shit. Good times. Having breakfast at the bakery downtown. Hey David, have you had any fares headed out to that old trade station? Nope. It's condemned. Nobody lives there. Weird. A guy came through here the other morning. Asked to have a wedding cake delivered down there. You didn't take the job, did you? Nah, he couldn't give me an address. Just the old train station. I'll keep that in mind. Go about my day. Christmas rolls around. No kids or wife to be around, so I'm working. Twiddling thumbs by the boat landing, watching it snow. Central tells me to head over to the Honky Tonk Country Bar at the edge of town. Who the fuck is drinking on Christmas? Head over. Old guy smoking by a truck that slid off the road. Need a lift? Call a cab. I turn my top light on. Guess you're the guy. I'm the guy. He gets in, and I crank up the heat. I ask him where he headed. He tells me, the old train station. Okay, it's condemned. I can't leave you in the wintertime with nowhere to go. Relax, I'm not living in the station. I'm converting a boxcar into an apartment. Oh. Apologize for being a shithead. Everybody's creeped out. It's fine. Drop him off. Christmas morning. Wake up downtown. Fell asleep waiting for a call, I guess. Central tells me that the guy at the train station wants me to come down before I get off of work. Goody, boxcar Willie wants a sit down. I cruise over. Wheel into the train station's parking lot. Can't get to the rail yard without walking around a platform. I get out and lock the car, just in the case. I walk around to the rail yard and find that he's been skinning dogs, deer, rabbits, cats, etc. He's sitting on the landing, wearing a red coat and black jeans. He spots me as I spot the skins. Hey, David. Thought I wouldn't see you. Fuck. If I run, he'll chase me. Hey, Van Go away. Which is just a fake name. I caught him by his real name. I step up onto the platform and try to ignore the skins being stretched into doors of the boxcars. I keep a good 10 feet between us. My truck is pretty fucked up. You think you guys could handle moving me back and forth between here and town? It's our job. Sounds like a plan then. He stands up and I step back. He turns away from me and sets a glass of wine down on the floor and reaches into his pocket, pulls out a watch and some money, gold dollars and regular bills. He offers $50 to make sure he gets top billing when it comes time for a ride. I accept and wish him a good day. Book it out of there. Tell Central I want nothing to do with the place. Send Ken or Barbie down. Actually, better not send Barbie. She'd make a nice coat. Van go away hung around town for a while before he abandoned the rail yard, and I guess joined the gypsies. Continued from previous thread, I guess. Friends of the Mountain of Murder slash Eastport Girlfriend Ghost Family booked me to take them down to a richy rich gated Bayside community. Rent a house for 2200 a week. What a deal. Fuck my life. Fancy new Escalade in the middle of a tourist community. Out of status everywhere. It's cool, I'm from here, I speak the language. Brought wife and husband here. I'll call them Mark and Cleo. Mark and Cleo rented a house and wanted me to stay in town because there's no taxi for at least an hour. So I stay at their place in the mother-in-law's house out back. I'm hanging out by the waterfront talking to an old flame. The fog has rolled in and the lights along the dock are making shapes out of the fog bank. Looks cool. In the distance, I see a white light, like a flashlight, out over the water bobbing up and down. The lighthouse about a mile away starts sounding off, a warning to boats. Foghorns are loud. Foghorns a mile away are deafening. Hang on, foghorn. I put my hand over the phone, watching that light. Looks like a robo with a headlight. Shitty time to come in from the island, bucko. The horn fades, and I pick up the phone again. So, how are the kids? We talk for a bit, and I watch that light. The waves are crashing because the tide is going out. Still, that light doesn't move except to bob up and down on the waves. Hey, I think there's a boat stuck. I'll call you back. I hang up and put the phone in my pocket before heading out onto the foggy dock. 
The light seems to be sitting at the end, but it's too far out to be tethered. I step out to the end of the dock, at least where it feels like the end. Too foggy to tell. I grab onto the railing and a lamp post just to make sure I don't take a dip. Hey, are you okay? I shot into the fog. I hear nothing. The light continues to bob up and down. Hey, I'm not a cop. Just tell me you're all right. No reply. The light just sits there in the fog. I smack my hand against the railing. Look, it's not cool to just be an asshole in the fog. I'm pissed. This dense fucker could get hurt. I step back from the edge. Something brushes up against me like I stepped into it. I turn around suddenly, expecting the person in the boat to be there. This 30-yard dock is crawling with fog people. This is a legit phenomenon in Maine. Humanoid figures wandering through the fog. Holy shit, ghost convention. I latch onto the railing. What the fuck do I do? I push myself off the railing and toward the shore through the fog people. I can feel them walking through me, or I'm walking through them. I see them dancing. I try to step around them, but it's just unavoidable. It feels like I'm walking through cobwebs and hot hair. I jump down onto the beach once I'm close enough and rush up out of the fog. I turn the headlights of the escalate on and I can see them clearly now. 20 or 30 of them walking around, dancing, just being fog people. I climb into the SUV and call my friend. Hello? Fog people, all over the docks. Calm down, David. They walked through me, Avera. Not her real name. No, you walked through them. Are they pissed? No, just happy to live again. Are you serious right now? Do they look like they're going to eat you? No. Go to bed and leave the fog people alone. I explained the light to her. It's probably just a manifestation of the fog people. This is why we couldn't work. You're fucking insane to be okay with this crazy shit. Go back to Mark and Cleo's place, lock the door, and hide under the blankets. Years ago, thought I was in love. Hot engaged to an Irish hottie. Good times. Her stepdad liked me. We drank together. They lived in a farming community, next to Amish, strangely enough. They owned property, about 80 acres or so. 60% of the property is wooded. Stepdad and I are walking in said woods. He's kind of half drunk, half serious, and he starts going off about how the woods are in his blood. Oh yeah? Are you related to Woody the Woodpecker? Let's call him Appleseed. Appleseed chuckles and says, no, he's part Malleseed, a tribe from here in Maine. That's cool. Is that why you don't get sunburned? No, it means I turn into a fucking wolf. Ha, <laughs> no. I stop in my tracks and grab a shoulder. You can't be that drunk already. I'm not kidding. Let me show you my altar. Oh, fuck, Indian Juju. I follow him quite a ways down in. So far, I can't hear cars anymore. Or really much more than some annoying birds. He leads me to a clearing, man-made, that sits at the bend of a river. Rushing water. He stands near the edge and places his hand on a carved stump. Lots of faces carved into it. Birds, wolves, foxes, and etc. It's not a totem pole. It's just a tree trunk with shit carved into it. Looks super old. He pats the side of it and asks me to come touch it too. I touch it. Feels like slimy wood. Okay. He shakes his head. Be glad she loves you. You're as mortal as they come, my friend. I shrug. Means I won't be chilling with wood, I guess. He chuckles and we go back to the house for dinner. A few weeks later, I get a call from his wife asking me if I've seen him. No, he's your husband. Don't get smart. He's been missing for too long. I come over with the fiance and we go down into the woods. Blood and guts everywhere. Sheep body parts all over. I stop in the path as we get closer. You two should go back. Oh, fuck you. I want to go back. They go back up the hill. I grab a branch from the side of the path and hold it like a club. I get closer to where his altars were. No birds. I step into the clearing and I spot the altar he showed me. Caked in blood. Sheep's head resting on top of it. The ground is covered in shreds of his clothing. Appleseed is nowhere to be found. There's a fire going, though, and a rock pit that he made, I guess. He's got a piece of stone in the middle of it that's making the fire green and blue. I can hear a bunch of rustling in the bushes all around me. There's a feeling in me, like I should run. My feet stay planted as I hold the branch up, ready to swing. Appleseed steps out from the bushes behind me. I turn and swing. He catches the branch. He's like 53 or some shit. I'm 23 or some shit. Holy shit. He's naked, by the way. Ugh. Appleseed is covered in blood. It's caked under his nails. 
He's got it in his hair. His balls have blood on them. He smiles to me. His teeth are bright yellow. Told ya. He says, tugging the branch out of my hands, like I'm a toddler holding a wiffle bat. I step back from him as he kneels down to pick up his glasses. Why? I had to prove something to you. What the fuck could killing sheep have to do with proving anything to me? I had to prove that you don't belong in his family. Good point. Bye then. I leaned over and grabbed his shirt. Uh, here. Clean your balls off. I basically died on my way up the hill. I felt him following me the whole time. I didn't look back, but I could hear his feet on the twigs and branches in the path. He stayed a breath's pace away from me the whole way. Get back up to the girls. He's just camping, guy stuff. Better leave him alone. Broke up with fiance. Found out later that she was cheating on me anyway. Don't go in the woods on a full moon. 2009. Up in Holton, way up on the Canadian border. The Woodstock side. Having dinner with an old friend who just made it to being a country music star. Let's call him Art. Art and I went to school together when I lived up there, ages and ages ago. I left when I was 10 and never looked back. We're outside at a bonfire, talking about tits and ass. Good times. Art gets up to get a beer, and one of his new friends comes back out with him. Let's call this one Jason. Jason and Art talk about the crazy shit they saw when they were loggers over in Jackman. Jackman is over on the bad border with Canada, the Montreal side. One road in, one road out, and it sucks. Jason starts the story. Ever hear of Bloody Bones, David? Doesn't sound familiar. That a new band? No, it's the nickname of a killer. Nifty. So, how about them Red Sox? Art laughs, and Jason continues. Here we go. Bloody Bones was a stalker. He would follow newlyweds when they came to the northern woods of Maine. He was raised by the Catholics of St. Mary's, but escaped into the woods one day and just kept going north. He lives in the woods outside of Jackman. One night, this couple of Massachusetts was up that way and got stuck on a logging road, headed to their honeymoon cabin. No tow truck till morning. They take refuge in a local church. Bloody Bones was there. They say he toyed with them for a while. I sink down in my chair. Shit, I hate this shit. Bloody Bones chased the husband back to the car, and then skinned him alive. Art leans into my face. My name's Bloody Bones, and I'm gonna kill you tonight. He found the wife hiding in the woods and chewed her fingers off first. Art leaned in. My name's Bloody Bones, and I'm gonna kill you tonight. Jason continues. He cut her up into small pieces, but sucked the meat off of her fingers. His trademark was to make a necklace out of their finger bones and hang it around their necks. The police found their bodies. Art leaned in, but he took their wedding rings. You can hear him coming when you hear the jingling of all those wedding rings echoing through the woods up there. My name's Bloody Bones. Yeah, 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 fuck off. I kicked dirt on them. Bloody Bones sucks. He's real. We heard the jingling in the woods. Yeah, fuck you. I still don't believe them, but it's a thing to think about when you go up north. 2009, spring. Condemonium opens up in the city, full of old people. Hell yes, peace and quiet. Fuck all of you motherfuckers in this apartment building. I move across the city to this place. Youngest person in the complex by 40 years. All old women in my building. Only dude in there. Elderly ladies are 70 plus years old. Get settled in and come home from work late one night. Sign off from Central and carry my six pack into the place with me. 1 AM, downstairs neighbor catches me as I come through the door. Hello, love. Her name is Dee Dee. She's originally from England and brought me cupcakes the first day I was there. Sweet old lady. Cute accent. Howdy, miss. I reply with a southern accent. She smiles and leans against her doorway. Black track suit. Wine glass in hand. Half full. Is my TV too loud? Can't even hear it in the hall. No, Dee Dee. It's perfectly fine. Turn it up if you want to. Oh, well. Thank you, sweetheart. I was worried I'd wake you. I nod and head upstairs. Later that night, I hear moaning coming through the floor. Oh yeah, bitch, take that dick. I roll over and listen for a bit. Dee Dee is listening to porn. Fuck my life. Old lady is masturbating below my bedroom to interracial porn. Well, it can't all be sunshine and rainbows. Get up the next morning, and Dee Dee meets me downstairs at the mailbox. I look like shit. Dee Dee leans over to me and whispers, Did you sleep well, Davy? No, not really. Just adjusting to the new place, I guess. Lies, all lies. I can sleep in the middle of the road if I have to. 
might be more comfortable. Oh, I'm sorry, Davy. Do you need more cupcakes, maybe? No, no, I already look like a cannibal with legs and arms. That's very kind, though. Well, can I ask a weird question? Sure, Dee Dee, what's up? Holy shit, this is it. I'm gonna have to move. Neighbor lady wants to assault me. You have a gal, Davy? No, Dee Dee, I don't. Well, maybe you should meet one of my friends. They're around your age. What do you say, Davy? Want to get to know a special gal? Oh, thank Jesus. Sure, Dee Dee, you know where to find me. I step past her and head up the stairs again, going through my mail. Your haircut is sexy, Davy. Don't change it. I shudder a little, going into my place. A few days go by, and I pick up a woman from one of the swanky condos by the river. She's all dressed up, headed to my building. Wonder what's up. I try to talk to her, but she just smiles. Okay, doesn't speak English. Great. I drop her off, head back to work. Central calls, and three more women are headed over there. All of my what? I pull into the hotel. These girls get in. None of them talk to me. I drop them off. Okay. I get in late that night, 3 a.m. or so. Back is killing me. I come in and head up to my place. I open the door and come in. Turn on the light. Dee Dee and four women are sitting in my kitchen. Holy mother of Christ. Fall through my doorway and into the hall. Dee Dee, what the fuck? I shout as I sit up, hearing her and a couple of the girls rush my way. Sorry, love, it's a surprise. Breaking and entering might be okay in London town, but here in the States, it is not cool. One of the girls, the first one I brought, helps me to my feet. Oh, hush. Come in, we have booze. It's my place. Are they my booze? Of course they are. Fantastic. I can't report her, she's an old lady. Who's going to believe me when I say an old lady and a squadron of supermodels broke into my place? I take my jacket off and sit on the couch, flanked by two of them, both blondes. Okay, this isn't so bad. Dee Dee steps up to me and takes off her jacket. Nope, 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 nope. Dee Dee, I have to work in the morning. I don't have time to do this right now. Relax, love, it's just warm in here. Calypso, you and Juliet get Davy a drink. I know it's her because she's calling for Davy. I get up and go to the door in my boxers and tank top. Davy, I heard you screaming last night. Are you okay? Why didn't you ask last night? Um, I'm fine, Dee Dee. I don't remember screaming. Oh, maybe I was dreaming of you screaming. She walks off down the hall and goes down the stairs. My face went. I shut the door and check out those scratches. Gone. All gone. Just the bloody tank top on the floor. A week passes and I'm home late again. Bar nights are keeping me out longer than I want, but Central trusts me to toe the line while they find a new bar guy. I come in, covered in confetti this time. Bachelorette party. So much titties. I come through my door and turn on the light. No Dee Dee. No strange women. Find a note on my bed. Open it up, and it just has a black thumbprint in the middle. Leaving your mark, huh Dee Dee? I throw the note into the trash and go to bed. I have nightmares about being ripped apart by those girls. Dee Dee jumping on my chest. I wake up to the smell of burning cinnamon. Not cool. I go out to the kitchen. It's not my place. Smell the air. It's coming from the floor. Dee Dee is burning something. The smell goes away by noontime. Central gave me the day off. I spend it napping, snacking, and watching shit on YouTube. That night, my apartment gets really, really warm. Sweating balls, man. I draw myself a cold bath and fall asleep in the tub. I wake up a few hours later, hanging out of the tub like somebody tried to drag me out. Scratches on my shoulders and arms. I stand up out of the tub and immediately feel like I'm lighter than air. I wobble around on my feet for a bit, trying to remember how my feet work. Burning cinnamon again. Get dressed. 11 p.m. Go down to Dee Dee's apartment. Knock on the door. Rustling. Dee Dee comes to the door in just a robe. Half tied. Gonna barf. Hey, is everything okay? Yes, David. I keep smelling burning cinnamon through the floor. It's none of your business. She shuts the door, and I go about my business. Notice later that the scratches are gone. Get to work late the next day. Central is pissed. I tell them to deal with it and go about my day. Get a call from my landlord that he's renting a hotel room for me for the next few days. Why? Electrical fire in Dee Dee's apartment. Is she okay? She wasn't home. Well, that sucks. Go by and get undies and swim trunks. Hotel has a pool and a hot tub. Chillax in the hot tub all night. See Calypso and Juliet check out. 
One of my company's cabs takes them away. They look freaked out. Needed back in Slutopia, I guess. Landlord calls. Did Dee Dee tell you she was moving? Nope. She's gone, David. Oh darn. Oh gosh. Oh gee. Apartment gets released and I come home. Landlord is in Dee Dee's apartment. Let's call him Gerald. Gerald spots me and calls me in. She's gone, David. Took the carpet with her. Damn. Place looks like no one had ever lived in it. Notice a black thumbprint above her bed. No more scratches or weird dreams. Never hear of or from Dee Dee ever again. 2004. Halloween time. Leaf peepers watching the trees and shit. Roll up in the old Escalade before the piss and shit monster of Murder Mountain ruined it. Pick up a guy at King's Gates. Here we go. Stalker got kicked out. Nope. Let's call him Samuel. Samuel was studying under Stephen King to become a creepomatic writer. We drive off and the guy, maybe in his 30s, throws his briefcase into the back onto his luggage. Something wrong, champ? That guy is like a child. Oh boy. It's like I'm dealing with an eight-year-old. What's wrong with him? Get this, okay? He has to sleep totally covered by the blankets, with only his head poking out. I stare in the mirror for a moment and nod slowly. Hell, if I had all the nightmare fuel living in my brain, I would probably shrink wrap myself before bed. He has to have nightlights in every room and every hallway. So he's a weirdo. Oh no, it gets worse. Great. Bitch fest all the way up to the airport. Did you see the house next to his? Mossy abandoned looking heap? Yes. He bought that off of the people that owned it after their daughter was assaulted and murdered. I blink a few times, disbelief lingering in my heart. So, that's odd. He goes on and on about how that little girl came over and gardened with his wife and pestered him about his writing. He and his wife would send her home after a while, but she always came back. So, she gets kidnapped, assaulted, and murdered. Parents leave town. King buys a place, get this, and he uses it as a haunted house. That's a little sick. I know, right? King uses it as a haunted house for Halloween for years. Says it's cause the girl loved Halloween. Weird shit starts happening, right? People get pushed, hear laughing, footsteps. It's a haunted house. It's supposed to do that, right? In July? I nod. Fair enough. So he shuts it down because he's afraid someone will get hurt. He has his office moved too, so he can look at the house while he works. On rainy days, he locks himself in that room and sits in that window, watching the house. It's like he expects her to make faces at him in the window or something. Well, that's a whole new level of fucked up. I reply, that's not even the worst of it. When he gets stressed out, he goes over there and talks to her. Nope, nope, nope. We get to the airport. The guy pays me and I wish him well. Tourists want to see King's house. I tell Central to send another driver. My brain only sees that little girl standing in the window, shaking her head. So I just want to note that on the day that this happened, I also had to dodge a body careening down I-95 in Newport after it fell out of the coroner's truck. Get a call from Central to head down to Augusta Air, bringing Hippie Chick to Hippie Encampment just outside of town. Stock up on Pepsi, take a piss. Headed out of town, Dave. Yep, more hippies headed out to that hippie camp. Out of status. Too bad they're so pretty. Store clerk and I laugh. Head down to the airport in the Escalade. Standing at the gates, holding a sign. Darla. Tie-dye babe straight out of a Sunny and Cher music video waltzes up to me. Welcome to Maine, sunshine. Hola. She teases and hands me her bags. Yep, baggage bitch. I load her things and get in the SUV, and we head north. So what brings you to this part of Maine? I'm going to Free Meadows to lead a cleansing ceremony. That sounds pretty fun. Men aren't allowed. Not so fun now. She giggles and smacks the back of my seat. Oh, stop it. It's to cleanse the female body. So men don't need cleansing? You're a little too far gone. I nod slowly. Feels bad, man. We roll up to Free Meadows and a bunch of lookalike hippie women come out of their teepees and cabins. They circle the SUV. Friends? Believers, she replies, opening the door. I get out too. They give me a wide berth and slowly make their way around to her. Everyone hugs. Now, kiss. Dot JPEG. I close the back gate after unloading her things. She motions for me to come to her teepee. Oh, yes. 
I carry her things there and tuck them into the back. She's taking her shirt off. Uh, should I go? Does the female form frighten you, David? No, Darla, I'm just polite. Social structures, there is no polite. She slides a tie-dye dress on and kicks her pants off the rest of the way. So, will that be all? She nods and I leave the teepee. She already paid before we left the airport. I get back into the Escalade and head out. I watch in a rear view as they all hug again. Filthy hippies. Later that night, I get a call from Central to go back out there. They send me in the regular cab. Darla's sitting by the road. You rang? I ask, rolling down the window. David, please go to town and bring back bottled water. You got it. I return with the water to find no Darla. I drive down into the encampment and discover a huge bonfire at the south end of the camp. I get out and pop the trunk. Darla steps up behind me. Wicker man shit going on here. She's wearing a stuffed elk's head. I jumped out of my skin as she comes up behind me. I nearly drop the water as I lean away from her. Good work, David. She hoists two water cases out of the back, like they're packages of socks, and totes them to the fire. I walk behind holding the one case that I can carry. Feels bad, man. One of the women steps in front of me and places her hand on the case. You can't go down there. I nod slowly and she takes the water from me like it's nothing. Cleansing or steroid therapy? Darla returns and hands me the fare, then asks me to leave. I comply and go about my business. Central calls me when I get to town that I have a couple of bar rats headed out of town. Drive by Free Meadows on the way. Big ass fire. No people. Uh oh. I keep my eyes on the sides of the road for the rest of the way. Drop off the drunks and head back. Fire is gone. Poof. All out. It's super dark down there, and I half wonder what's going on. I slow down by the road to enter, but I don't go down. I come to a stop, looking down the road. Moonlit figure standing in the middle of the road. Eyes like fire. I swallow hard as I can feel those flaming red eyes look into mine. I sit there for a moment, contemplating what to do next. I radio to Central that I'm getting out to check on Darla. I put the car in park and engage the hazards. I get out of the car and walk around the trunk. The figure in the road is gone. Oh, good. I tap my hand against the hood, unsure of what to do now. The brush moves a little closer to me than where that figure stood. A bright silver elk steps out of the bushes and assumes the same position the figure had before. Same red eyes. I step toward the road. The elk begins to trot up the road, dizzyingly uncomfortable now. What the fuck is happening? It's like 60 yards away thing is huge. Looks like a meat bus standing in the road. It stops at 50 yards and stamps its foot. I put my hands up. Okay, I'll go. I step back away from the car and then get back in. The elk comes up onto the road and stands behind the car, eyes peering through the back window into the rearview mirror. Sweet baby Jesus deliver us from evil. I put the car in gear and pull away. The elk follows for about half a mile. When I look back up, it's trotting down the embankment from the road, headed back to the camp. In the morning, I get a call from Central to head out to Free Meadows. I pick up the Escalade as the boss tells me it's Darla. I enter the encampment, a little weirded out from last night. Darla steps out from her teepee and her shirt and pants again. Other women follow her lead and step out as well. They circle the SUV again as Darla gets in. I load her things as every move I make is being watched. I get in after closing the gate. They clear a path for me to leave. You shouldn't have come back last night. I glance into the mirror, shrugging. The fire was out too early, so I figured, don't give me excuses, David. Okay, fine. We stay silent for a while, and I drop her off at the airport. An airport attendant takes her bags. Darla faces me and hands me a wad of cash. As I took the money from her, Darla grasped my hand, nearly crushing it in her grasp. Don't you ever, and I mean ever, interfere with what you don't understand again. She growls through her teeth, her eyes shifting that red color that the elk had for just a second. All right, all right, I'm sorry. She releases my hand and turns away, all in one motion. I get in the SUV, radio to Central that I'm clear, and headed home. Get home to find that she gave me almost $200 and a note with a heart in it. I throw away the note and pocket the cash. 2006. The city I live in has a spring-fed pond on a side street. Decide to go ice skating with former fiancé. She's really good. I, on the other hand, 
looked like a retard on stilts. She laughs as I fall on my butt. I smirk and pull her down into my lap. Haha, <laughs> fun times. Cheating bitch. It's about 8 a.m. We were early risers. It's maybe negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit out. Deep February. Normal temps. I get up after she does. Actually, she helps me to my feet. I look at my butt print and shake my head. The pond is known for a never freezing solid in the middle. Urban legend says it's connected to an underground aquifer, almost two miles below the surface of the earth. Yeah, whatever. Geology's for nerds. I wobble around a little more as these kids come onto the ice to play hockey. I remind them about the metal and they blow me off. Whatever, die, see if I care. Fiance and I huddle up in the pavilion by the pond and watch the kids fuck off on the ice. Suddenly, there's a massive thump from under the ice. One of the kids falls over. I snicker, but my fiance gets up to check on the kid. I see the ice pick up and drop, like the whole pond. I grab her arm before she steps onto the ice. Wait, Alana. Just wait. She's offended. The ice picks up and drops again. Another huge thump. Get off the ice, now! I shout to them as I scramble for shore. I kick off my ice skates and rush over to the edge. They're like eight, maybe ten years old. Grab a couple of them and yank them up the embankment away from the ice. Kid that fell over crosses the edge as the ice picks up. Drops down on his hand. Crunch. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I grab his hand. Fingers are broke. I know it. The ice lifts and yanks him and his bum hand off of the ice. Fiance is gawking disbelief at what she's seeing. I stand up and realize my toes are freezing. She. The center where the ice doesn't freeze solid begins to swirl. I look to my fiance and then to the kids. A loud popping noise fills the air around us before the swirling center just blasts upward. Thin ice chunks fly all over the ice as the ice picks up again. Feet are freezing. The ice settles down once more. The kids start crying. Fiance sits down and I wibble wobble back over to her. I sit down next to her and massage my feet warm again. What just happened? Don't know. I'm not gonna stick around to find out. I reply, sliding my boots back on. What about the kids? I look over to the kids who are just galloping down the street in their socks too. They are long gone, honey. We should be too. I get her to her feet and take her to her car. We get in as the ice groans, like it's about to shatter or something. Alana, it is time to leave. She puts the car in reverse and we speed away. Hear from my cop friend that there was a sewer leak in the pond. Oh, so hot shit made it look like something was trying to escape? You don't remember Taco Tuesday in high school, do you? Ha, very funny. He tells me the kid with the broken fingers will be fine and the kids are being told not to lie. I feel bad, but what the hell could I say? Pond master tried to chow down on some tinny bopper breakfast? I haven't been back to that pond. The pond has no living animal in it. No frogs, no birds, no turtles, no lizards, just bugs. Every once in a while, I'll hear about a crunch of bubbles erupting from it during the hot summer days, but nothing more than that. Skinwalker Reservation. Get home late one night after working the bars. Check email, and Central has me scheduled for a weekend booking in the western part of the state. Okay, fine. Didn't want to clean up puke this weekend anyway. Clean up Escalade for airport pickup. Three dudes from out west coming in. They have English names, even though they were clearly Native Americans, so let's call them Jeff, Carl, and Ryan. Arrive at airport. Stand at Escalator with my sign with Jeff's name on it, because he's the one who set up the booking. Three clearly Native dudes come down the Escalator. I'm expecting Dances with Wolves, Eagle Shadow, and Split Arrow for names. Nope, Jeff, Carl, and Ryan. That's fine then, Dot JPEG. Lured their luggage that is just some canvas sacks and a big wooden trunk. Trunk is heavy as fuck. On the way up, they tell native jokes and make fun of the way we drive in Maine. Herder, cars instead of horses. Now if you don't know, there's only one road that goes up to the far western portion of the state of Maine. The northwestern corner of the state is literally devoid of human development. Straight up Bear Grylls territory. Jeff tells me to head toward Jackman and he'll tell me where to turn off before we get there. Drive for a long, long time. Almost to Canadian border, and he tells me to turn off at Muddy Dirt Road. Engage 4x4 mode. Escalade goes full beast mode as we head down what feels like a logging road. Sure enough, I have to pull over for a logging truck to pass. 
truck driver is all, what the fuck is an Escalade doing here? Carl explains the loggers are coming into the tribe's territory and have repeatedly ignored their warnings about staying off their land. Ryan laughs. We continue up the logging road until we pass the loggers camp. Just a bunch of trailer trash mobile homes parked in a row with a big ass generator feeding the trailers. Beer cans everywhere. Jeff sighs seeing the mess and directs me to speed up. I do, but only so much. The mud makes driving a bit difficult because of the huge logging truck ruts in the road. Escalade slides a bit around the turns, and the guys think it's cool that we're drifting in a luxury SUV. Me, not so much. We come up to a clearing that leads to a large cattle ranch style fence. Fences maybe 10 or 12 feet high. Reminds me of an old Western movie, Fort Wall thing. Jeff tells me to stop before we get to the fence. Ryan and Carl get out, and Jeff and I stay in the SUV. Ryan walks up to the wall. Looks like he's talking to it. Carl stands in front of the SUV with his arms crossed, and legs spread like he's a karate master trying to show off. I pick up my phone to message Central, but there's no signal. Great. Now I'm going to get scalped, and I can't even tell anybody about it. Jeff notices me waving my phone around for signal. No signal out here, Dave. We bought a satellite phone, though. You mind if I use it to let my boss know that I'm safe? Sure. We need to call our wives and tell them we made it, too. You're welcome to use it after us. Thanks, Jeff. No problem. Just be quiet for a while, though, okay, Dave? I'll let you know when it's okay to talk. Your tribe doesn't like the white devil? Something like that. Jesus, could you be more ominous? I cross my arms and wait for whatever is going to happen next. As soon as I do, the fence opens up. This part is kind of weird because the fence doesn't look like it has a hinge to open, but it opens up just wide enough for the Escalade to get through. Carl steps onto the running board and holds onto the luggage rack. Go ahead. Carl knows what he's doing. Ryan hops on just as we pass by the fence. He rides the same way Carl does. We travel onto a wagon trail, trees framing either side. I see a clearing up ahead. We drive into an old time log cabin looking community. Solar panels and a water wheel seem to feed the town. A stream runs by the village. Dogs and kids are running around. A bunch of people wearing flannel shirts and jeans stop and watch us drive in. Everyone is super duper native. Jeff tells me to pull up to the cabin nearest to the entrance to the village. Carl and Ryan jump off as we come to a stop. Jeff tells me to stay in the SUV until he comes and gets me. I shrug and put the Escalade in park. Jeff, Carl, and Ryan go into the cabin. An hour goes by, and they don't come out. I recline the driver's seat and put my hands behind my head. I wake up to Jeff tapping on my window. It's dark now. The radio clock says it's been about four hours. Goody, my back is going to love me for sleeping in the SUV. Dave, come on out. I get out of the Escalade, and Jeff takes me into the cabin. The cabin is maybe a three bedroom. There's a young guy with short hair sitting at the dinner table. He remains stone silent as I enter. Jeff tells me to sit. Ryan and Carl are by the windows, looking out toward the tree line behind the cabin. Dave, this is Ben. The young guy sits up and extends his hand to me. Nice to meet you, Dave. Same to you, Ben. I shake his hand and we talk for a bit about who I work for and how I feel about native land rights. Ben nods to Jeff and they both get up from the table. I start to get up, but Ben puts his hand on my shoulder and shakes his head. You are here for the weekend. We have strict rules about whites in our village, and I can't have you walking around. Jeff tells me you're a smoker. You have permission to leave the cabin and smoke by your truck. Other than that, you are to stay in here and wait for Monday. I look over to Jeff, who shrugs. Uh, fair enough. It's your village, and I'm just the driver. Ben nods to me as he, Jeff, Ryan, and Carl head toward the door. You're a good man, David. I trust you to obey my wishes. I give him a thumbs up and get up from the table. Ben, Ryan, Jeff, and Carl leave. Great, now I'm stuck in a cabin all weekend. The cabin does have indoor plumbing, a fridge, radio, and plenty of books. No TV though, perfect. Bored out of my mind and trapped in a tinderbox. I step out onto the front step for a cigarette and notice that the kids, dogs, and people are all inside, just me and the SUV out here. I go back in and lay down in the biggest bed in the place. Well, it's not so bad. I wake up a little before dawn to the sound of coyotes howling nearby. Well, that's a fun noise. 
They're loud and annoying, so I go to the window to see what the problem is. I see three or four guys on horses with torches, chasing the coyotes toward the loggers' cabin. Well, that's weird. I figure it's them trying to chase the loggers off. Well, I'm up now. I brew myself a pot of coffee using their old-timey stovetop coffee maker, and I wait for the sun to come up. I step out onto the step again, and I have a smoke. Kids are outside lugging firewood. The dogs are gone, and the adults are milling about gathering eggs or whatever natives do. I sip my coffee and smoke. The day goes by uneventful. That night, I hear the coyotes again. I get up to go to the window, but it's really dark tonight. No moon, I guess. Probably rain clouds. I get my phone and turn the flashlight function on. Holy fucking shitballs. I turn the flashlight on and there's a dude standing outside of my window. He's looking in at me and the color of his eyes is gone. Like his eyes are rolled back into his head. I jump back from the window and rush out of the room. I shut the door behind me and go into the bathroom where there aren't any windows. I wake up in the morning in the tub. Definitely wasn't a dream. I'm not nuts enough to sleep in the tub for the hell of it. I get up and go out for a cigarette. As I open the door, Jeff is standing there. I drop my cigarette and lighter as I back away from the door. Jeff puts his hands up and steps in. Well, okay. You need to calm down. Fuck you, I do. One of your buddies was peeping tomming me with dead guy eyes last night. Dave, it was just a precaution to make sure you weren't sneaking out. So a guy stands out the bedroom window pretending to stare at his own brain? Jeff explains it was part of a ritual, and that guy was just making sure I wasn't causing trouble. He was being an ass and rolling his eyes back to scare me. Well, fuck that guy. Jeff laughs and brews a pot of coffee for me. It tastes orgasmic. He smokes with me outside, and I feel better about what happened. Ryan and Carl come to the SUV and take the big trunk out of the back. Ben stops by and apologizes for the freakout. He assures me that no harm was intended. I trade jabs with him about culture, but we end up laughing it off before parting ways. He tells me there's a thunderstorm due tonight, and that I need to keep an extra pair of panties handy, just in case I get scared. Har har. No kids today. All day. Just the women folk milling around the village. After dark, I step out for a smoke, and notice a huge bonfire down by the stream. Too far away to see much of anything, but what I can see is that they have a bunch of dead coyotes in the fire. Purify the land, I guess. I go in for the night. I hang a blanket over the window this time, just in case my stalker shows up. I lay down and assure myself that this is the last night of this shit. I wake up around 2 a.m. My phone's charger is cutting out, making the phone flash on and off as the power is interrupted. Cook crash. A thunderclap brings me up out of bed. The flashing outside is like camera flashes, but the brunt of the storm is upon the village. I've seen thunder before, but this shit was nuts. I get into the fridge and decide to have a couple beers to calm my nerves. It's a native brew in glass jars. I pour it into the coffee mug I've been using and turn the radio on. The radio is fuzzy, but my music and the beer calm me down. The thunder pounds on the village for another hour or so before it moves off. It gets dead quiet for about 10 minutes before I hear gunshots. I set my mug down and step to the kitchen window. I see the lightning bearing down on the logger's camp, at least where I think that's coming from. The gunshots are coming from there too. I listen for a bit and figure they're probably chasing off the coyotes. As I turn away from the window, I hear the door handle of the cabin rattle. I pause. I feel my heart rise up into my throat. Oh, fuck this. It's probably Ben coming in to see if I shit myself. I open the door. It is Ben but he's half naked, covered in tribal pain. That's running down his body thanks to the rain. Uh, hey. Ben stares at me for a long moment before turning away from the door and walking into the darkness. Jeff, Ryan, Carl, and a bunch of other guys walk by the door, also headed toward the logger's camp. I step out onto the step, but the guy with the rolling back eyes shoves me back through the door. He leans in at me and growls. I remain still, and bring the door around the shut. He leans back away from the door and lets me shut it. I sit down with my back against the door and proceed to swallow my heart back to where it belongs. Stay put. He growls to the door before I hear his boots smack against the gravel near the step and he leaves. Fuck me. Fuck, fuck, fuck me. I fall asleep there and wake up to a knocking at my door a little after sunrise. Hey, 
Dave, you up? It's Jeff. I crawled to my feet and opened the door. You look like shit. Thanks, can we leave? I ask. Jeff tells me that he's ready, and so are Carl and Ryan. I take a shower and brew coffee while they load up the SUV and say their goodbyes. When I come out of the bedroom with my suitcase, Ben is sitting at the table. Ben turns to me. Thanks for bringing them here. He gets up and leaves. $200 is sitting under my coffee cup. Not worth it. So not worth it. $200 tip, but it's so not worth it. Jeff, Carl, and Ryan are in the SUV, and I load my stuff up. As we pass through the gates, I see smoke pouring up from the trees where the loggers' camp was. I swallow hard. The guys joke about the women at the camp being ugly and fat. I stay quiet as we come into the loggers' camp. The trucks are gone. The generator is smoking and half-melted. I slow down by one trailer that has sunk into the mud, almost tipping over. There's a black streak running from the door to the front corner of the trailer. Jeff tells me to speed up. I pause, and he nods to me, confirming my wide-eyed expression. We drive a little further, and a tow truck is pulling one of the logging trucks out of the ditch. It went off the road and landed on the cab. Bloody glass is everywhere. The cab of the truck is smashed in. The driver was probably crushed to death. We go around the truck. Once we're at the airport, Jeff, Carl, and Ryan get out, and I help them with their trunk. It smells like fire now. Ashes and fire. Jeff shakes my hand and leaves. Carl and Ryan do the same. I tell the whole story to Central, and they think I had too much of the peace pipe. So, this one just happened recently. Get a call from Central. Guy came in on the bus. Needs a ride three times over. Turn down my radio and head over to the bus station. Guy is buying a sandwich and a soda. Looks like an out-of-stater, but whatever. He's stone silent in the back until he unwraps his food. The guy eats like he's never eaten food before. Chugs the soda and tosses the trash out the window. Hey, littering is illegal here. I've got a trash bag, just ask. Okay, okay, my bad. He apologizes and almost immediately falls asleep in the back. Oh boy, Dad JPEG. Here we go, Dad JPEG. We arrive at the town, and before I can ask where to drop him off, he wakes up and starts giving me directions. This is a little weird. He directs me up to a lakeside camp and asks me to come in and help him get the fire started. I'm pretty uneasy about this, but I am a sucker for $20 bills. He and I go in. The lake house is pretty cool. One story, two bedrooms, fireplace, gas oven, old timey fridge. He has no idea how to start a fire. So I get the fireplace roaring and he hands me a couple 20s on top of my fare. Before I get out of the town, Central calls me and tells me to go back. Are you serious? I get back there and he's sitting on the ground by the mailbox. He gets in front with me and asks me to take him to town. I explain it's the same fare because I'm out of town. He agrees and I take him to McDonald's, the bank, and the hardware store. He takes a really long time at the hardware store. Central is pissed. He comes out with a box full of shit. I joke with him about building a second floor. He wants none of it, not even a chuckle. We get back to the lake house and he's mowing down on food again, eating like he's starving. He asks me to carry the box in because he's got to unlock the door. He opens the door. The place is plastered with symbols, triangles, squares, hexagons, squiggly math symbols. He has me set the stuff on the floor and again tips me on top of the fare. I get back to my service area. Central calls and explains that he's on the phone, asking if I can do a grocery run. All right, enough. I have spent the whole day with a psycho. A cartload of groceries, almost $300 in food. He's nowhere to be found this time. I find a check made out to the company with the cost of the groceries factored into it. The fare and my tip, again. I get into the car, cops pull in behind me. Oh, great, this again. Officer McSizzle and Bacon asks me to get out of the car with my hands up. I abide. The dude abides. He frisks me. They search the car. No guns. No nothing. He shows me a picture of the guy I've been dealing with. I explain what's happened. They put me in the back of a cruiser and bust into the house. Next thing I know, McSizzle and Bacon gets in and we leave. Ah, uh, am I being charged with anything? Accessory to murder. The fuck you say? Brought to the state police barracks and interrogated. It's not like the movies. I'm sitting at McSizzle and Bacon's desk as he writes what I have to say down. 
No handcuffs either. We're really cool with shit here in Maine, I guess. Mick's sizzle and bacon shows me a picture of a woman and two kids. Don't know them. He asks me about the guy again. This goes on for about two hours. Finally, Mick's sizzle and bacon loads me up into the cruiser and we head back to my cab. His cell phone goes off and he flips on the blues as he answers it. He guns it as we careen toward the big bridge connecting the mainland to the island nearby. He fast and furious is his way through a couple of intersections. We roll up on what looks like a piggy convention on the bridge. He parks below the bridge barrier and Call of Duty's his way to the drunk where he puts on his riot gear. Stay in the car. Five minutes later, the SWAT truck shows up. Bang, bang. Yellow smoke rises up over the bridge. Bang, bang. Gunshots. Mick sizzle and bacon comes back and we head to the lake house. You're free to go. We've apprehended our suspect. Uh, okay, who do I sue for this? Get smart, and I'll shut off the dash camera. I put my hands up as he lets me out of the car, and I back my way to the taxi. He backs out, and floors it, leaving me. The house is a crime scene. That yellow fuck-off tape is all over the place. One officer on duty, hanging out on the deck. Nice day for a crime scene, huh, officer? Move along. I salute, and get in my car. The next day, I get a call from his attorney. He asked me if the guy mentioned anything about lights over the lake or why he painted those shapes on the walls. I refer him to my statement to the police. New story comes across the TV as I'm on the phone. Triple homicide. Girlfriend, girlfriend's son, and girlfriend's daughter. Slaughtered, like animals. Ask the attorney if we're done. Attorney explains that his guy is suffering from mental issues and that it's illegal for me to go shooting my mouth off to the media. I explain that his client is a crazy asshole and that he deserves a chair. Attorney hangs up. Central tells me Mick Sizzle and Bacon called and apologized for his actions. I shrug it off. About two months ago, some kids got picked up by the police for trafficking bath salts. Around that time, I started getting more late night calls from Cross Street where the kids were captured. People would get in the car and go to McDonald's or other houses, hotels, just anywhere for a while. One night, I showed up early to pick up an older man and take him down to the bar. He turns the yard light on and checks out the window for me. I see him put his jacket on and his hat and then he runs out to the car. He gets in and locks the door. What's the rush, chief? Wife don't know you're going out? He snaps from looking out the window to looking at me. You don't hear that? He asks. I look around for a minute and shake my head. The howling? He asks. I roll down the window a little bit. Sure enough, I hear a low drawn out howling in the distance. It's just a little louder than the engine of my taxi. He grabs my seat and leans up. Please take me to the barn now, he begs. I roll up the window and take him downtown to the bar. He hands me my fare and gets out. He's much more relaxed now. He walks into the bar like he wasn't a raving madman earlier. The night goes on and I do a few more pickups from Cross Street. Each time I pick up, I roll down the window and the howling is still there. No matter where I pick up, I hear the howling far away from me. No one else brings it up but the old man. Central calls and asks me to go pick up the old guy by the waterfront. He walked down there, I guess. I roll up and he's sitting on one of the benches by the public landing. He sees my headlights against the pole in front of him and he stands up. He gets in the car, clearly drunk. I take him home and he sits in the car for a bit. He looks out the window and then back to me. I wait patiently with him. Thank you, he sighs. He pays me and slowly gets out of the car. I hear him muttering to himself as he gets out of the car. He stands by the door for a moment before he goes in. I roll down the window and the howling is very close right now. I roll the window back up and radio the central that I'm clear. The connection is scratchy, weird for being right in town. I begin to back up, smack, thump, fuck me, I ran somebody over. I put the car in park and I get out. I run to the back of the car. Are you okay? There's no one there. I kneel down and I look under the car. I see the shadow of legs on the other side of the car. Wait, hey, man, I'm sorry, I didn't. I don't find anyone standing over there. I begin to make my way to the open driver's door. I notice that the howling has stopped. I pause and look around before I hear footsteps coming from the back of the cab. All right, did I hurt you? I ask, turning around. No one is there. My skin starts standing on end when I get into the car. I shut the door and lock the doors. I back up slowly, but my headlights pick up movement. I stop again and look around. 
Maybe some teenager's fucking with me. I put my arm over the seat, and there's a shadowy figure in the back seat. I slam on the brake hard this time and put the car into park. I open the door and jump out. The figure is faceless. It sits there for a moment before evaporating into nothing. I hear footsteps again behind me and turn to face them. A pair of eyes are headed toward me in the darkness. Golden eyes, like a cat staring into a flashlight or something, but human height. I back up against the car and then slide back into the driver's seat. I back up out the driveway and leave as fast as I can, tires squawking a little bit as I leave. I radioed to Central that Cross Street is off limits for me tonight. Every time I've picked up on that street since, I hear the howling in the distance, but I don't go looking for it anymore. This past Halloween, I have no kids and my nieces and nephews are too old for anything that I need to attend to feel like a part of the family. Central has me booked for the night, running trick-or-treaters all over town. It's a fun gig. I have a CD with Halloween music on it and I play it through the night. I used to dress up, but it's kind of overkill these days when the kids just want the candy. Get a call to pick up just outside of town. Woman and her son are coming in for some edible loot. Roll up to the house, and the lights are off like nobody's home. I record the run on my log and wait. Sure enough, this goblin-looking thing pops up in my window, screaming its head off. I jump back from the glass, but it's just a kid. He's maybe eight years old. He points and laughs as his mom gets in back. He follows from the driver's side passenger door. I got you, I scared you. I laugh and agree, you sure did. She jokingly scolds him for scaring people. I'm cool with whatever. We head into town. They point out the houses, I stop. Both get out, run up to the house, and do the trick or treat thing. I keep track of the stops. We're about midway of the trek to one of the street that everyone goes to. The kid asks me to come along. Mom agrees. What the hell, I need to stretch my legs. We get out of the next few houses. I decide to chat up the mom. She's kinda cute. We finally arrive at the hotspot for Halloween candy, Front Street. There's too many kids and adults to drive down the street. The cops have it blocked off. Mom and son get out. Son taps on my window and asks if I can go. Mom shrugs. I radio to Central that I'm getting out for a bit. I lock up the cab and off we go. This whole place reminds me of an opening to Michael Myers movie. I walk along talking to mom about life and raising kids. Let's call the kid Junior. Junior does the heavy lifting of this adventure and bum rushes each house for their sugary loot. Mom and I are talking. Kid goes missing. Fuck. I notice it first. Mom starts panicking. I knew I should have kept him close. I step up to the last house he was at. They point up the street. I take mom and we rush up to the next house. He was a few houses ahead, surprisingly. We get to one house, no lights on, nobody outside. I knock on the door and an old woman answers. She complains about me knocking and says she doesn't do Halloween. She shuts the door in my face and I return to mom. No dice, Junior hasn't been here. She pulls out her phone to call 911. I put my hand over it and point toward the backyard of this house. His treat bail is on the ground just before the street lights end. We rush to the back corner of the house. Junior is out back playing with some of the other kids. Hey mama, come meet my friends. Junior waves us over. A little girl and two boys have been out here with them. They're playing on an old tire swing tied to a huge oak tree. It's pretty dark behind this house, but I can make out their faces in the dark, and they're having a good time. Mom joins in for a moment before I remind her that this isn't public property. Junior frowns and hugs onto the little girl. I don't want to go. Mom takes him by the hand and says that his friends can come too until we find their parents. The kids travel with us for a little bit. The two boys are dressed up like ninjas. They're a little older than Junior. The girl is dressed up like a witch with no hat. We stay close to them this time. The trick-or-treating ends on the street, and we head back to the cab. No sign of the parents. No one's looking for them. The police on the street radio back to dispatch, and dispatch reports no missing children. I sit down with the kids by the police cruiser while the cop takes down their information. The little girl stays close to Junior, and the two boys pretend a sword fight with their fake ninja swords. Mom makes phone calls to see if her friends recognize them. The old woman from the house steps up to me. She looms over me for a minute before I stand up. She shakes her head disapprovingly, and the little girl begins to cry as she stands up and begins walking away. The two boys stop fighting and wave goodbye to Junior as they start walking away too. The old woman turns and begins to walk away. The cop gets out of his cruiser and questions her for a minute. They're mine. 
The old woman growls. She scoffs at the cop's next question and leaves. He follows her and spins her around. She smacks his hand and they exchange some words I can't hear over the exhaust of the cruiser I'm standing by. She shakes her head and walks away from him again. He returns to us, adjusting his hat. She's their grandmother. They were supposed to be in bed. I look at my watch. 7 p.m. We've been with them for a couple hours. I explain the situation, and he shrugs. So, you just let some old lady take three kids because she said she could? Hey, I didn't give you any grief when you lost your kid. Mom and I follow the old lady back to the house. I knock on the door, and she answers it. She slams the door this time when she sees it's me. Mom and I decide to give up at that point. Junior, however, leans over the side of the front porch and waves at the backyard. Mom and I lean over the railing too, but there's nothing but that tree out back. They went home, Mom. Let's go home too. I look at her and she looks at me. The night goes smoothly. Junior takes two buckets of candy home with him and is tuckered out. Junior falls asleep in the back. Mom asks me about the house and the kids and I tell her I've never been there before. She calls around on her ride home. She explains that the old lady inherited the house when she was a little girl, and that's all anybody knows about her or the house. I shrug it off. It didn't occur to me until that night when I dropped off a couple of trick or drinkers just down the street from the house that Junior wasn't waving to the tree. I still check that house when I'm on Front Street to see if those kids are around. No such luck. Don't know where they went but they're not at that house anymore. The old lady is though. This has been an unreasonably warm December. It snows, but it melts off in a few days or less. Fog everywhere. Thick fog too. The nights have been so bad that we have to limit our service area just after dark for about an hour. Central calls and tells me to pick up at the local supermarket. Roll up. There's an old lady there. Not quite as old as Marceline, but up there in the blue hair territory. I get out and help her load groceries into the car. She waits politely as I load the groceries. I close the trunk and open the door for her to get in. She hands me her cane and slides into the front passenger seat. It's getting dark and I have to take her out of town where the fog is very thick. I hand her her cane and shut the door. We get out to the main route to her house and the fog begins to get thicker. I turn on the fog lights, but they do little more than help me stay between the yellow and white lines, basically in my lane. Let's call her Vera. Vera leans toward the dash, squinting her eyes. Lots of fog tonight, she states, as if she's trying to use some super seeing power. Yeah, it's been like this for a week or so now. I reply, slowing down, as we come to a bend in the road. She leans back in her seat, I guess realizing she can't see that the fog like Superman or something. You're a good driver. I'm glad you're going slow through this mess. Thank you, ma'am. I'm doing my best. I'm Vera. And you are? David. Most people call me Dave when I'm not in trouble. I reply sarcastically. The fog is so thick now, I can just make out my lane, and literally nothing more. Maybe four feet in front of the car. Thankfully, the GPS I keep strapped to the dash helps me stay on the road, headed toward her house. I almost drive into the ditch, turning into it though, because I can't see where the road is at this point. We drive down what feels like a mile-long dirt driveway until I see the floodlights on the barn next to her house. We pull up to the door, connecting to her driveway. I help her get out. She insists on staying out here with me. I shrug it off. I unload the groceries to just inside her door. We have a policy about going inside people's houses. I put the milk and other heavy things on the counter for her and explain not to mention it or somebody's gonna have to call me David. She laughs it off as I head to the door. I open the door and her laughter stops immediately. I'm still facing her. I turn slowly to look at the door to find out what stopped her laughing. I see a bunch of humanoid shapes standing around my car. The floodlights from the barn give the fog an eerie glow that really highlights these shapes. These shapes standing around my car move on and more come along. I shut the door and she steps up to the window next to the door. She pulls back the curtain and waves her hand to me to tell me to come look. Dozens of them walking by now, headed up her driveway toward the road. I see what looks like a wagon being pulled by a horse go right through my car, like it isn't even there. The fog just moves around the car and reforms at the back bumper. She covers her mouth and we wait for the fog to dissipate. What feels like hours go by, and really, it's only 15 minutes. By now, 
I've counted at least 30, including the wagon, going by. The fog begins to sink to the ground and disappear. The night air has become too cold for the fog to be so high. I reach for the door handle, but I notice she's pretty rattled. Vera, it's fine. Just stay inside tonight. I'll call my daughter. She'll come stay the night with me. She says, stroking her chin, looking out the window still. I open the door and begin to head down her steps toward my car. She comes to the door and peeks out. Be careful, David. I smile to her. Go call your daughter, Vera, and have a better night. I get in the car and have a little bit of a freak out after she closes the door and turns on her kitchen lights. I sit back in my seat and breathe off the anxiety I'm having over this before recording the fair. Centro asks what took so long, and I tell them that she's a chatty old lady. Who the fuck would believe me about the fog parade I just saw? On my way back to town, the fog is lower now, much easier to see, but I can see their footsteps in the road. The way the fog is moving, like people walking through water. I slow down as I come up on them, but decide to drive through. Nothing happens. They keep walking, I drive on. I ask one of my buddies, who's a local yokel, he knows about the area's history. He explains that Vera's land used to be a troop gathering point when soldiers from this area left to serve in the Civil War. I ask why there, and he explains that her family used to feed and supply the troops leaving. Hey X, I only have two stories. Are you guys in the mood for some weird main shit? This was about a month and a half ago. Central calls me. Tells me I'm picking up a little boy with special needs and taking him to school five days a week until whenever. I'm excited. I love kids. I go to bed early. Gotta get this kid at 7 a.m. I want to be sharp. Roll up to a ghetto-tastic house. Six boys. One mom. All the boys are special needs. Mom brings out this little guy. Let's call him Franklin. Franklin is five years old and he is the size of a two-year-old. He might weigh 45 pounds. I watch her strap him into his car seat. He's silent the whole time. He travels a half an hour with me to a school in Bangor. We're together a half an hour, twice a day. We roll up to his office building of a school. He was silent the whole ride. I watched him in the mirror, and all he did was wiggle his feet and watch trees go by out the window. He takes my hand as we get out of the car. We go inside of the building, and his school is on the fifth floor. He holds my hand through the elevator ride. We get off the elevator in a very blank white lobby slash waiting room. There's the elevator, the stairs, and one door. The door needs a key code to open it. No key code. Franklin wiggles my hand with his hand and points to the camera watching the door. I knock on the door, and in seconds, a woman opens it. Blonde hair, blue eyes, red shirt, black pants, no shoes. Franklin starts through the door into the hallway with another door at the end that's open and kitty noises are coming from it. Teacher puts her hand on my chest, stopping me. I nod and kneel down to Franklin. Hey, Franklin. I gotta go. Your teacher can hold your hand, though. He looks at his teacher and then lets go of my hand and walks down the hallway. I shrug and stand up. She takes his backpack from me and forces me out of the doorway by shutting the door on me. I glance up at the camera then leave. Around 3 p.m., I arrive at the door. Two other guys, dads I presume, are in the room as well. Both are silent, standing near the door. The door unlocks, and one little girl steps out. She smiles to one of the men, and he picks her up. They leave. The door opens, and a little boy steps out. He seems sad. The other man steps over and rubs his shoulders before they walk to the elevator and leave. I step up to the door, and the door opens. Franklin's teacher stands in the doorway and hands me his backpack. But where's Franklin? I ask. He steps around from behind her and holds out his hand for me to take it. I take his hand and smile to his teacher. She shuts the door. He starts toward the elevator and I follow. He's silent on the ride home. When we get home, his mom comes to my car to get him. I tell her about him being quiet. Oh, Franklin's just shy. Give him a few days. As she's getting him out of the car, he wraps his arms around her neck. Is daddy home? He asks. She smiles to him and strokes his head. Not tonight, she replies. Okay, he says, laying his head on her shoulder and waving to me. I wave back and they go inside. After a few days, Franklin starts talking. What are those? 
he asks, pointing to the clouds. I look up and point to the clouds. Those are clouds. Sometimes it rains when they come around. Other times, it snows. Sometimes nothing happens. They just float on by. He nods. I like clouds. I smile to him, and we continue on. In the elevator, holding my hand, he looks up to me and asks me how high the building goes. Oh, probably into the clouds. It's a pretty tall building. I tell him, pointing up. You're really tall. Can you reach the clouds? He asks. Nah, I'm not tall enough to reach the clouds. Not yet anyway, I tease. Someday, I'll be big like you, and I'll touch the clouds whenever I want. He said, smiling. I have no doubt, pal. I tell him, messing his hair up a bit. The same routine. I'm not allowed in. Teacher in red and black, no shoes, answers the door. As he gets out of the car at home, at the end of the day, he asks his mom again if his dad is home. She shakes her head, and he reluctantly accepts it. The next day, she has him loaded up, and I ask her where Franklin's dad is. He's around, she said in a dismissive tone before heading back inside. The same routine. Not allowed in. Barefoot. Red shirt. Black pants. I stop her this time. He asks about his dad every night. I tell her. She crosses her arms under a chest and watches Franklin walk down the hall. All the children here ask about their parents. She replied flatly before asking me to step out of the doorway. I stay there for a minute, watching him as the door closes. I hear one of the security cameras crane around to me. You may leave now, a woman's voice, different from Franklin's teacher, says. I shrug and head toward the elevator, and the camera returns to wherever it was pointing before. On the ride down, I take a look at the cubicle hell leading to the elevator. Everyone is running numbers. Most of their phones are from the 90s. None of them look up at me. I find a lady at the end, getting up to go to the bathroom. Hey, any idea where a good cup of coffee is around here? I ask. She stops, dead in her tracks, and looks at me. I have a boyfriend? She sneers, and continues on her way. I snicker, and rub my cheek for a moment. Is that listed on Google? I don't want to get lost finding that place. I shout after her as she steps down a darkened hallway toward an illuminated bathroom door. I shrug and leave. This goes on for a few weeks, and I finally stop his teacher from pushing me out of the doorway. Wait, wait. Why are there only guys here picking up and dropping off kids? I ask. She pretends to be blindsided and then insists that I step outside of the hallway. Children come here for a variety of reasons. Dads are usually the ones who have time. I know you're not Franklin's dad, so stop with the questions, she states. The door unlocks before she turns to it, and she enters peacefully. Please leave, the voice of the intercom instructs. All right, I'm going, I say, putting my hands up. That afternoon, I pull into Franklin's driveway, and there are a ton of cars at his house. All the boys are outside playing with squirt guns. They're chasing one guy, maybe in his 40s, around the yard. He's very well dressed. Red shirt, black pants, white tie. He's wearing shoes. Sneakers at that. Franklin spots this guy and sits up in his seat, trying to take off the belts off his car seat. Daddy's home, he shouts as his mom opens the car door. He jumps down out of the car and rushes over to this guy. Daddy, daddy, he shouts as this man picks him up. I get out of the car, and the man in red, carrying Franklin, comes over. He holds Franklin against his chest and offers his hand to me. Hi, I'm Dad, he says with a bit of a laugh behind his words. I'm David. I take his hand and shake it. Great to finally meet you, Dave. I've heard a lot about you, he says, bouncing Franklin a bit. Franklin giggles and hugs his dad's head. Good things, I hope, I stated, shoving my hands into my pockets. Great things. Franklin behaves better at school. He even eats lunch there now. Thank you for getting him under control. I don't know what you're doing, but please keep doing it, he says, turning away from me and heading back to the squirt gun fight. I don't see dad again for a few days. I bring Franklin to school. The door unlocks, and there's dad. He smiles at me. Franklin looks up at him and walks into the hallway, not saying a word. 
I frown and look up at Dad. Franklin lets go of my hand once he's through the doorway. Don't worry, Dad says, patting me on the shoulder. I back through the doorway, and he watches me as he closes the door, blocking my view of Franklin. I think about that for the rest of the day. And then, when I get Franklin home, I ask him about his day. He tells me about ABCs, dancing, and playing with dinosaurs. I ask him about Dad. Daddy's not a school silly, he says to me. I stare for a long while before his mom opens the door and takes him out of the car. Did you have a good day? She asks Franklin. He repeats the same thing he said to me. Exactly. I sit on the hood for a minute as she signs the paperwork for transportation. So, Franklin's dad, he works at school too? I ask. Nope, he is around though, she says and walks inside with Franklin. I shake my head in disbelief before getting in the car and going home. That night, I get a call from Central, telling me that I need to wait after I drop Franklin off for school. The next day comes, and I wait, and I wait, I wait, I wait, waiting. Finally, after half an hour, an elderly woman, we'll call her Marge, steps through from the stairs and hands me a clipboard with a piece of paper that says, I, David Blankerson, hereby declare that I will not mention the things I have seen or experienced while transporting Franklin Blankerberger. Marge clears her throat and taps the board, telling me I need to hurry. I sign and shove it back into her chest. Hell of a school, lady. I state, heading to the elevator. It opens before I push the button, or before I get to it. I turn back, and Marge has headed through the door already. It's shutting behind her. Now, this past week, Franklin has been having headaches. He leaves school rubbing his forehead. He tells me it's because of a new song. I ask him to tell me about it. He says he can't because it makes his head hurt. Franklin goes to school with two pairs of pants and only wears long sleeves now. He goes to school a bit dirty, but comes home literally smelling like roses. He still seems normal. We talk about dragons and firemen who fight dragons. Haven't seen dad or Marge. Teacher ignores me when I talk to her. This week has been a living hell. I am so damn tired. This past Sunday, it's been raining forever now. I feel like I'm in a depressing chick flick. I'm outside using my grill. A loud scream comes from the woods out from behind my house. Nearly drop my tongs into the grill. What the fuck? I walk down the steps out of my place and look towards the woods. My neighbor stops out of his place and looks towards me. What was that? He asks. Like, I fucking know. I shout back and continue down my steps. I keep a flashlight in my truck. I trade the tongs for my flashlight and head up to the tree line. The light doesn't go through the woods very much because of the springtime fog that the woods have this time of year. Hey, are you okay? I shout into the woods. There's no reply. My neighbor goes back into his house and watches from his bedroom window that faces a tree line. I shine my light up into the air just because I've seen horror movies. I know something might be lurking in the trees. So I don't hear anything and decide it was some kids fucking around in the woods. I go to sleep that night, really freaked out. Monday, I go to work, everything is okay. Regular day transporting Franklin. There's more on that later. I come home late that night and I hear the screaming again. All right, that's enough. I get my flashlight and head into the woods. There's a gravel pit a ways into the woods behind my place. I walk about 200 yards or so and step out into a clearing, leading to the edge of the gravel pit. Hey, enough with the screaming! I shout toward the hole. The screaming comes again. It sounds like it's coming from the bottom of the pit. Fuck my life. Someone is down there. I step out to the edge of the gravel pit and shine my light down to the bottom. I see the water moving down there. There's a good 12 foot deep pool of water at the very bottom of the pit. I shine my light into the pool. The water continues to shift and move, but my sight can't pick up what it is. It's too deep. I think there's someone fighting for their life. It's raining, by the way. Streams of water are pouring down into the pool, making it deeper by the minute. I head down the road, built into the gravel pit, but the ground is so soft. I have to slow down or risk falling onto the sloppy gravel. I hear the screaming again, as I get closer to the pool. I shine my light into the pool, long enough to see 
a fish thing moving near the surface. It's not big, maybe football sized. I kneel down and shine my light onto the fish. It's a trout. What the fuck? I question, shining my light around. Fish can't scream. I wait there, and the water calms down. That fish goes away. The rainwater pouring into the pit rises up a little higher. My feet are covered in water. It's risen a good five or six inches in ten minutes. I walk back up the road and to the tree line. I shine my light down into the pit again. Nothing. I get my wet pants off back in my house. They smell like salt water. There's a cable that blocks the road that leads to the gravel pit. Wednesday rolls around. I heard the screaming on Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. I wait by the cable that blocks the road to the gravel pit. The foreman, or whatever, rolls up to move the cable. It's clouding up the rain again. He asks me what I'm doing here. I think there's some kids horsing around up here. I've been hearing screaming. I tell him about going down there and where I live. He offers me a ride into the pit so I can show him where. Like it's not fucking obvious. We roll up to the edge of the gravel pit. It's about 20 feet deep with water now. He gets out and explains that it hasn't been this deep before. It begins to rain. I explain that deeper down there was a smaller pool and a fish in it. He looks at me like I have six heads. I shrug and point to the pool. He gets back in the truck and I follow. He takes a drink of his coffee and asks me why I came down here, hearing the screaming and didn't call the police. I was a kid once. Didn't think it was worth jail time over a few beers from dad's fridge. He nodded. Yeah, I get it. He tells me that the pit is deeper than they wanted to go initially and that there is an aquifer about 300 feet down. The pit is only 100 feet deep, but they've been finding sinkholes. I tell him about the salt water smell on my pants. He shrugs and explains that there are salt deposits all over the place. He brings me down to the end of the road and locks the cable across the road again. I get out and thank him for the ride. He tells me to be careful because the pit is holding more water than it ever has before. I heard the screaming again last night and probably will tonight too. I'm just going to ignore it. The pit guy didn't call the cops about kids, so why should I? I don't want cops asking me if I hide bodies down there or something that will get me in trouble. Back to Franklin. As we come into school, he holds my hand before we even get inside the building. The people in the cubicles get up as we come in and smile to him. Good morning, Franklin. The lady with the boyfriend says waving to him. He smiles and waves back to her. I smile and nod to them as they watch us get into the elevator. The music is some low tempo jazz music and Franklin hums along with it. Do you know this song? I ask him. No. He replies before going back to humming. The elevator door opens and dad already has the door open waiting for Franklin. Franklin lets go of my hand and heads into the doorway. The elevator door starts to close and I step out. Hey, you got a minute? I ask, trying to get dad's attention. Sure, David. He says, stepping out of the door and shutting it behind him. What's up, pal? He asks, crossing his arms over his chest. He was telling me about how angels are trapped on the sun, and that's why Jesus is coming back. I explain. Dad chuckles. You're right to be alarmed. He explained, turning back toward the door. Uh, is he okay? I ask. You'll be fine, David. See you later. Dad explains, shutting the door behind him as he leads into the hallway leading to the classroom door. I come back later and Franklin is waiting for me as the elevator door opens. His teacher is standing behind him, hands on his shoulders. Good afternoon, David, Franklin's teacher says. Good afternoon, I reply. He had a great day today, she explains, offering Franklin a yellow skittle. He bites it out of her hand. She laughs and ruffles his hair before pushing him toward me. She turns away immediately and heads for the door. I kneel down to him. Do you like Skittles? I ask. No. He explains, picking up his backpack. Why did you eat it then? I ask. Because I like the yellow ones. He says, smiling at me. I shake my head and stand up. As we exit the building, the people in the cubicles get up again. See you tomorrow, buddy. They say, one after another. The ride goes normally. He wiggles his feet in the seat and hums the jazz song again. Friday is pretty much a rerun of that. 
He just asked if I could find a DVD of Blaze and the Monster Machines. Sleeps like a baby back there. I almost forgot he was there if he didn't smell like soup. <laughs> Why did I say it like that? If he didn't smell like soup. Why? <laughs> Were you here last night? Yup. Came out to have a smoke. Some weird stuff happened. Animal weird? I shake my head and explain what happened. She nods and blows me- Oh, it's a she. Ew. He slides on a pair of men. What? Oh. Foghorns a mile away are deafening. Hang on, Foghorn. I put my hand over the phone. Oh. <laughs> like I was speaking to the Foghorn. I hang up and put the phone in my pocket before heading out to the foggy dock. Get a foggy dock. Oh yeah, bitch. Take that dick. <laughs> what the fuck? Awa? <laughs> Awa, it's too big. <laughs> what the fuck is Awa? Poof. All out. Poof. All out. Come on. Poof. All out. Dude! Poof. All out. My fucking tongue keeps clicking like that. Why does it keep doing that? Poof. All out. See? It did it again. Fuck. Poof. All out. Oh, okay. Check email, and Central has me scheduled for a weekend booking in the Western. In the Western. Fuck's sakes. Jeff tells me to pull up to the cabin nearest the other. <laughs> Before I hear his butts. <laughs> butts. And he leaves. Fuck me. <laughs> whoa, whoa. I slow down by one trailer that has sunk into the. <laughs> the house is a crime scene. That yellow fuck off tape is all over the place. <laughs> that yellow fuck off tape. They're playing on an old tire swing tied to a huge oak tree. <laughs> I said huge oak tree. Fuck's sakes. Angels are trapped on the sun. And that's why Jesus is coming back. Why did I say it like that? He's coming back. <laughs>